Once you start manipulating the money supply, you have one of two outcomes possible. You either have a deflationary bust back to economic reality, or you have continual manipulation of the currency until you go into the crack up boom, which is hyperinflation, when the currency loses all relevance. All right, everyone. I am here today with Robert Breedlove. Uh, before we jump into the episode, I got to give a quick shout out to two of our sponsors, Luca, a data provider for Bitcoin and Exodus, also a uh, crypto uh, Bitcoin wallet. Blockworks is also bringing back our flagship conference, Digital Asset Summit, September 14th and 15th in New York. Um, and that's all we got for you today. So let's jump into this episode. Robert, how you doing, my friend? Good, Jason. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So I need your feedback on something. I am I'm keynoting an event tomorrow. It's to about 500 people who okay. don't know what Bitcoin is. The event, if this gives you any sense of what the event is, it's uh, the title is something along the lines of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, like curse mm, or benediction, yeah. right? right? And I am really looking to, I was really reflecting on how to talk about Bitcoin to this audience. And my struggle oftentimes becomes... To explain Bitcoin, you have to explain inflation, the Fed, money. So I wanted to ask you, what is your way that you, how do you explain Bitcoin to an audience like this without diving into a 30 minute spiel about money, central banking, Fed, things like that? Yeah, so this is I'll give you my 30 second elevator pitch on Bitcoin. This is when someone recognizes me or, or just asks me, knows I'm into Bitcoin and they're like, just give it to me in 30 seconds. I say that Bitcoin is an insurance policy on central banking. The more dollars that are printed, the more valuable that policy becomes. Hopefully that makes it as simple as possible. Um, now for an audience that's into blockchain, quote unquote blockchain or quote unquote crypto, um, that's probably not a satisfactory answer. And they probably have a little bit slightly deeper knowledge, I would assume, if they're attending a focused conference like that. Uh, another explanatory method I'm, I'm working with lately is that to compare Bitcoin, I don't even know if it's a comparison, actually. I think this is pretty accurate, that Bitcoin is the internet. Like Bitcoin is the latest layer in the internet protocol suite. So we have, you know, stuff many people have heard of HTTP, TCP IP, uh, SMTP, etc. I think, you know, these interlocking layers of moving information permissionlessly, I see Bitcoin is sitting right on top of that, letting us move economic value permissionlessly. Hmm. And so through that lens, you can view all alternative crypto assets as intranets. Right. So Bitcoin is a protocol ossifying into the broader Internet that no one can control. No singular entity can turn off the Internet worldwide forever. Right. There's that that option does not exist. So it's an apolitical protocol, whereas everything else, all alternative crypto assets, there is someone or some group that can change the rules or, you know, change the supply or change the governance model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then I think, so that if you use that framing, you have internet competing with intranets. And that's a useful framing, I think, historically, because you saw, we saw what happened to intranets. Um, another way to say that is you have open source system competing with closed source systems. And my argument there would be that the open network always outcompetes the closed network because the closed network, two things, it accrues enforcement cost. So it has to protect its boundaries, which are, there's a cost to that. And then it also has to um, enforce the rules, right? So there are rules inside of the closed source network. If people, if there's ever a disagreement to those rules, um, they either have to leave the network and do something else, or the rule has to be enforced itself. So um, we could even consider the U.S. dollar as kind of a closed source network, right? It's limited access, one node, the rules are forced on people. There's a cost associated with that enforcement. Um, 
And two, it doesn't benefit, a closed source network doesn't benefit from globalized developer mind share. So um, you can get a number of developers involved, but you typically have to have a foundation or something else, actually like a private entity directing the, the development efforts. And these lines aren't, you know, it's not a bright line. You could look at something like Ethereum that is close to decentralized, but it still has this, these uh, singular influence vectors, right? Where they can, they can roll back the chain if there's a DAO hack and things like this. So in my mind, it's the, the open source internet networks outcompete closed source intranet networks over time. And in that, in that framing, I think definitely in the sphere of money, Bitcoin just outcompetes everything. Now, the verdict, in my mind, is still out on whether an alternative use case for a crypto asset or distributed consensus can work, you know? And, and I don't even know the criteria of success at this point. Like, again, ether looking at Ethereum, when do you say it's a market-proven success? When is it? When is it something that's really, that has staying power? Um, I don't completely know the answer to that. You know, for me, it's not close right now because they still, this Ethereum 2.0 or shift to proof of stake and all of these things, these are huge unknowns, right? Huge computer science problems, huge network problems that are just unresolved. So for me, it's not a market proven use case yet, but we have to ask ourselves at what point do you change your mind, right? I, and I, I don't know exactly where that is, but... The idea that I'm trying to grapple with right now is I've, I've been a pretty hardcore Bitcoin maxi kind of guy for a while. Um, but then I see protocols and platforms like Compound and Aave and Uniswap. And I look at something like Uniswap, right? I try to take all the biases out of it. I try to take the Twitter mafia out of it. And I look mm. at something like Uniswap where they've raised, you know... 20 million versus Coinbase's 500 million. They have 15, 20 employees versus Coinbase's 1,200 employees, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing on some days more volume or close to as much volume, trading volume as Coinbase, right? right? And it's a much more open, permissionless, um, anybody in the world can access it. It doesn't matter. There's no KYC, there's no AML. And then I look on Twitter and if I have a positive post about Uniswap, you've got a bunch of Bitcoiners coming after me, right? And you yeah. get a hundred direct messages saying you're shilling something like on like DeFi. And my response to a lot of them ends up going down the rabbit hole of where do you hold your Bitcoin? Oftentimes it's on a centralized platform like mm -hmm. a Coinbase or a BlockFi, which I honestly enjoy those platforms as well, mm -hmm. but they're far more centralized than something mm -hmm. like Uniswap. That, that's the big problem and question I'm working out in my head right now. Yeah, th those are important questions, and I, yeah. you know, I do not know the answer. I think that's actually probably a better example to look at than even Ethereum is something like Uniswap because I think they eclipsed Coinbase in trading volume almost a year ago, maybe. Maybe a year ago, yeah. DeFi yeah. summer twenty twenty. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I don't know the answer. Like this is part of the thing, and part of the friction I think I have with Bitcoin maximalism is that it is proclaiming to have the absolute answer like the end full stop this is the answer this is all that ever will be and i just can never i cannot see myself thinking that way like as much as i have learned <laughs> going into the space is like like we said earlier like the more answers i get the more questions i have so i want to be open-minded i want to learn what's possible i don't know like will uniswap disrupt Coinbase and, you know, who knows? I don't know what other use cases there are for distributed consensus at this point. Um, so I'm just trying to keep a questioning mind. Yeah. Let's, um, let's actually zoom back out. The biggest, um, the most amount of messages I got when I said I was bringing Robert onto the podcast is talking about money and also inflation, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the conversations happening right now are, media and uh, central banker activity and financial institutions starting to admit that perhaps inflation is here. And 
the biggest question that I think people have is, is inflation here to stay or is it not here to stay? Is it transitory? How are you approaching this question? Yeah, this word inflation, um, like so many other euphemisms used by corporate media or central banking, uh, we first have to disentangle what it means. You know, Let's typically central bank media is going to say inflation is CPI, which is consumer price inflation, a metric that they control, frankly, and they manipulate to back into whatever their targeted number is. Um, and it's so real true. quick then, what, so what does that mean that they manipulate CPI? Because I've heard a lot of like uh, Eric Weinstein on the portal always yeah. talks about this. So. Yeah, so they've changed the calculation of CPI multiple, multiple times. Uh, I want to say half a dozen times maybe in the past 20, 30 years. And when you see the changes that are made, it, it's truly asinine. So I guess the first thing I should say is that if you read a book like Human Action by Mises, he will tell you, in very elaborate detail why a universal inflation metric is not possible. So price inflation is as subjective as the aims a market actor determines for themselves. So everyone has their own inflation coefficient, if you will, based on what they're trying to buy. So there's no such thing as a universal inflation metric. Can't have it. Uh, however, central banks try and create one anyways. They call it CPI. Uh, this calculation behind CPI, when it would, I think this was in the 80s, um, you know, would get outside of the 2% target range. They would actually start, they, they made, there's a number of adjustments. There's the hedonic adjustment, which says they'll actually ignore certain price increases if the quality increased as well, um, which is very arbitrary, right? You'd be like, oh, these blue jeans are nicer, so the price went up, but it doesn't actually matter because they're better material. Um, complete BS. They also stripped out quote unquote volatile categories. So here's how asinine this is a metric designed to interpret and convey the volatility of prices, stripping out of its calculation prices that were deemed to be too volatile. So the big ones, food, energy, right? Like things that people need just every single day, every single moment you're consuming energy, right? We're consuming energy right now. We consume food multiple times a day. Um, they've just taken this impossible task of establishing a universal inflation metric and then completely used it as a lever of manipulating perception, right? And, I, and it's phenomenal to me how conditioned even smart people are into believing that CPI is the inflation rate. Um, so there's that there's consumer inflation, let's call it. Then there's asset inflation, which is the prices, the nominal prices of assets, which typically when money is being printed, its value is being diminished market actors, uh, being smart as they are, will put their money in something that cannot be diluted, right? So typically real estate absorbs a lot of the store value function, commodities, gold, even Bitcoin's explosive meteoric rise has been driven largely by uh, expansionary monetary policy, one could argue. And um, so when I refer to inflation, I think the best way to look at it is just the increase in the money supply. So I use, typically look at USM2. Um, these figures have become more difficult to track recently. Post COVID, they've discontinued M2 and they're changing the calculation on that. And um, it's just, I like to say, <laughs> it's clear as clear as mud and twice as dirty, the way they calculate <laughs> all of these things. So um, the great hope with Bitcoin is that it actually, it obliterates this concept. This, when we say inflation, first of all, the typical person that doesn't understand it, I think it was named inflation as a euphemism because inflation sounds good. Like if you're talking about an economic metric, it's inflating, 
my price is going up, or I'm sorry, my house is going up in price. My stock and my wages are going up. Things are going up. It's good. It must be good. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a psychological trick, Um, and if most people do not take the time and space to step back and think about things from at least the second order. Like if you just think about things from the first order, you're like, oh, wages, house, stock portfolio, all increasing in price, all good here. Um, But you have to take one more step back to actually realize it's the unit of economic perception, which is the dollar or your local fiat currency, that's being diminished. That's what's actually happening. Um, So with Bitcoin, you know, we would just obliterate this notion of inflation. The word inflation, I don't like post Bitcoinization. I don't think the word inflation will be used in the same way it is today at all. I don't think know if it will be used in economics at all. Um, you could even say Bitcoin supply. It's not technically inflation the way we traditionally understand it, which are these arbitrary changes to the money supply because Bitcoin is pre-programmed and predefined. So we could say it's it's a block subsidy or you know you could choose another term. But there's no uncertainty to it. There's no element of human nature or bureaucratic whim determining at what rate the money supply will be changed um, and who the new proceeds will be doled out to, right? This element of human distortion is removed in a Bitcoin system. And that's why it's so important. Because again, if we consider what money is, to use a Zabo term, it's intended to be a trust minimized medium of economic exchange. So today that is not what we have at all. We trust central bank bureaucrats not to serve their own interest, right? It is crazy to say the least Hmm. Um, because surprise, surprise, human beings being what they are, they do serve their own interests uh, and they disfavor all other market actors that depend on that dollar to hold its value across time. So, you know, as we say, Bitcoin fixes this. So deflation, right? And but with deflation, prices fall. You know, people stop buying stuff in the hopes that they'll it'll be cheaper in the future. When people stop buying stuff, demand for products and services goes down. Businesses lay off workers. Unemployment rate goes up. People's paychecks fall. Um, and this basically creates this death spiral of further price cuts. And this kills the economy. In your mind, we don't see that. In your mind, it sounds like we see more hyperinflation, which so t- so take me so take me to where you see this going and extend it out to whatever time, five years, 20 years. Take take us where you think this goes next. Yeah, I would first uh, push back on the deflationary death spiral narrative. I don't think that's actually how it works. Um, hmm. So the, the presupposition built into that is that demand goes away when prices go down, like everyone's just hoarding money, saving for the future. But the reality is demand's a constant. We have to eat, we have to consume, we have to survive. Now we may restrict demand to increase savings, but savings underpin investment. So that's a net benefit to the long run economy. I think the deflationary death spiral narrative is another central bank. Very um, Keynesian. Yeah. Yes. Keynesian narrative completely. Um, There are, Deflation is a good thing, by the way. If we're talking about price deflation, what does that mean? It means that we are becoming smarter at allocating resources towards satisfying more wants with less efforts. So all of a sudden, getting a ribeye steak doesn't require my you know, full-time attention as a rancher 40 hours a week so I can have a ribeye. I can just go spend $20 per pound at the store and get a ribeye delivered to my table. Um, you could think of prices as a proxy for what problems the market wants solved. So this, the more prices shrink, that means it's less of a problem, right? Like just think about how you spend money. If you have a $3 a month subscription to whatever it is, whatever software or magazine or something, you probably don't think about that that much. But if you have a $3,000 a month expense, maybe it's your rent or something like that, like you tend to think about that a little more. So it's uh, it's kind of a reflection of the problems market actors want solved and it the price serves this function of drawing attention right so it draws attention from entrepreneurs if they're like hey there's a lot of margin over here i can go and satisfy this want and earn a profit 
Or if there's less price and less margin, it's going to get less attention overall from both consumer and entrepreneur alike. So, and Jeff Booth is brilliant on this topic. He wrote the book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow. And he's arguing that a currency, to have a sustainable civilization, you have to have a monetary system that allows for deflation. Deflation, the, you know, specifically the decline in prices and aggregate price levels, this is a reflection of how much smarter we're becoming, how much more economic we're becoming, frankly. So if you don't have a system that allows for that, it's, it's um, you know, equally dispersing the gains of economization. If you have a system instead premise on inflation like we have today, the central bank is harvesting that economic surplus that's being created. So we're getting smarter, faster, better at doing, saying, making things via technology. But the bank needs to keep increasing prices to keep reducing real debt burdens, uh, predominantly of government, who's the biggest debtor in the world. Um, and in doing that, they are, it's, it's sucking the blood out of the economy, effectively. And for that reason, I think that despite the deflationary pressures we face from technology and innovation, I think that central banks have the incentive and the precedent of, of printing, the incentive to print and the precedent of printing that they will continue following this path until we have a hyperinflation type event. Um, now it's, it's never smooth. You know, we typically have these deflationary shocks initially. Everyone rushes into dollars and treasuries. When uncertainty spikes, people try to get into safe assets. Uh, you'd see hard assets decline sharply in, in, in those um, risk off events. But then the central bank response uh, tends to increase the money supply significantly, trying to restore equilibrium. And that's when you see um, hard assets do extremely well against the dollar. Do you believe, so my, my grandfather was a politician. I think he was a good guy, right? Yeah. I'm biased, but I think he was a good guy. I genuinely think he was looking out for people. And I see people like Jerome Powell and I think he's got kids. He's got grandkids, yeah. right? Yeah. He's got friends. He's not a yeah. bad person. He's not, he's not in here. He doesn't wake up every day and say, I want to hurt the lower 50%. So what like do you think that these politicians and that the central bankers don't understand this or do you think that it's more coming from a place of i don't want to be the one holding the bag i think i can keep this this ruse going for the next four right. years and then i can get out what what's happening here it's a great question um something i've actually thought about quite a bit and i would first say that finance is complicated right it's complicated as it is, um, but it's become more complicated through all the machinations we've put on top of it. So I think most politicians, unless they are specifically, you know, treasury or finance focused, probably don't understand the banking system. Like all these topics that Bitcoiners um, discuss openly, I don't think most politicians understand that, frankly. Um, so looking at central bankers, I have a hard time believing Jerome Powell going on national television saying there is no connection between monetary policy and wealth disparity. Maybe he actually believes that maybe he has, you know, drink the, the Kool-Aid to such an extent that he actually believes that but I don't I think he's a smart guy and I don't think you could understand the workings of a central bank and not understand how it is impacting the poor. And these, I mean, they pour over data, right? They're a data driven, supposedly decision making body. Um, so when I look at the individuals, I don't know that it actually serves us really well to look at the individuals because what is needed, the way, the way I try to describe it is this, is that, Individual characters and personas are emergent properties of the incentive schemas they inhabit. So whatever your incentives are, 
um, we could assume you have really deep moral rooting and you're not going to waver from your proper moral path. But if I put you in a situation where you're constantly incentivized to act against your own moral code or, or whatever the moral code is, if you don't break individually, someone eventually will fill the role, right? You could go your whole life uncompromisingly, uh, sticking to the moral code, no matter your incentives. But eventually someone's going to come into that seat that you once occupied and they will waver from moral rectitude to serve their own financial interests or their own self-interest. So I think we have to fix things systemically from the incentives up. I actually see, again, human beings and characters as a second order effect of the incentive structures we create. And the, the problem with central banking and fiat is just that it's a broken incentive system, right? We're incentivizing short-term thinking. We're so far detached from economic reality at this point where we th actually think that capitalistic failures, companies making bad decisions, incurring losses. When a company incurs losses, this means that the collective will of the market is saying that this, whatever this company is doing is not satisfying our wants. It's not solving our problems. So if this company creates enough losses, eventually that capital needs to be reassimilated into the marketplace and put to other better uses based on market actors voting with their dollars, buying and selling. If you interrupt that Darwinian process through printing fiat currency, you are, it's cancerous to socioeconomics, right? We call them zombie companies. There's a reason we call them zombie companies because they just go on living uh, thanks to central bank policy, but they're not serving anyone's interests, right? They're actually, they get worse because you've now distorted the incentives for the executives inside that zombie company that they don't care what the market says. They don't care what wants consumers want satisfied. They only want to serve the central bank master that's got them on life support. So the central bank will print more money to save these companies, these failing institutions. They're stealing wealth. They're, they're, they're siphoning and harvesting economic surplus from the productive economy and channeling it into these failed organizations or failed institutions to keep them alive. It is counter evolutionary. It is the most destructive thing we can do. And now it's the norm. It's the absolute norm. We print money to solve all of our problems, to paper over all of our bad decision making. We think we can just print money, um, paper over the losses and move forward. And we think there's no consequences to that. Once you start manipulating the money supply, you have one of two outcomes possible. You either have a deflationary bust back to economic reality, right? Where supply and demand actually clear or the, or the market price clears where supply and demand touch rather, or you have continual manipulation of the currency until you go into the crack up boom, which is hyperinflation when the currency loses all relevance. So the incentives of central banks typically lend us to the latter outcome to hyperinflation. And that's what we've seen historically is that hmm. once you start manipulating the money, uh, it's like, you know, the drug analogy is very useful. It's stimulative initially, then it has diminishing returns and you keep trying to inject more and more into the patient until finally the patient dies. All right, guys, it's ad time. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. There's one company that's powering a ton of the crypto data in the space. And by crypto data, basically there's all these uh, companies, traditional financial institutions that need crypto data for, you know, accounting purposes, for tracking the value of their assets, for running audits, right? And so there's one company, they're called Luka, L-U-K-K-A. I've talked about them on the podcast before. They're powering some of the largest businesses in the world in both the crypto and traditional financial services space. They're the primary pricing source used by S&P Dow Jones indices for their new crypto index. So I want to uh, just throw this out there. If you guys are any sort of business that needs to value crypto assets, create financial statements, uh, perform any sort of normal accounting audit process, you guys should head on over. It's Luca, 
L-U-K-K-A, Luka.tech, L-U-K-K-A dot T-E-C-H forward slash empire, or just head over to Luka.tech forward slash empire. Tell them I sent you. They'll take care of you. Alrighty, let me know what you think. The other day I posted on Twitter, I said, who's the best entrepreneur? Who's the entrepreneur that everyone should know in crypto, but maybe doesn't know already, right? We're not talking like the mainstream, the super big folks. Who's the best entrepreneur that's kind of under the radar in crypto? God, post went crazy. Got like 300, 400 comments. There was one name that kept popping up, JP Richardson. JP Richardson at Exodus. So I thought, man, that's crazy. Exodus is one of our sponsors. Let me call him out, right? So JP Richardson, CEO of Exodus, done an amazing job building one of crypto's most loved apps. And there's a number of reasons. They got a mobile app, they got a desktop app. You can instantly exchange over a hundred different currencies. They've got interactive charts. Uh, they're fully integrated with uh, the Trezor hardware wallet, so you can always be secure. So if you're looking to buy crypto, if you're looking to just get away from just buying one or two currencies, you want to explore other things, go to exodus.com forward slash empire, or just search Exodus in the uh, App Store or Play Store. Check them out. Shoot me a DM on Twitter. Let me know what you thought. Go follow JP Richardson. Go check out Exodus. All right, exodus.com forward slash empire. So, so with hyperinflation, you don't go... 2% inflation to 2000% inflation. So at what point does inflation get bad, right? Is 4% inflation bad? Is 10% inflation bad? What happens at 50% inflation? Well, again, we're back to this sticky issue of what is our measurement percentage? You know, they say, again, CPI today is what, two, three, four percent according to a central bank. If you look at something like the Chapwood Index, which I think was maybe discontinued, they were actually calculating inflation back on the old 1980s and 1970s uh, criteria, and it was above 10% in most major cities in the U.S. So, you know, 11, 12, 13%. Um, so it's like, how do you define inflation? Then how do you define bad? Um, f- from just a, a very first principle standpoint, I would argue that all arbitrary changes to the money supply are bad because the only way you can have an arbitrary change to a money supply is if you have a legal monopoly on money and that's what central banking is so the fact that we have communism or central planning in the most important market of all which is the market for money which is the foundation for arbitrary supply inflation the whole thing is bad it's rotten right it's rotten incentives once again um, as far as when inflation really starts to rip society apart, which it ultimately does, um, I think we're past the point of no return. You know, when I look historically, we increased the money supply in the U.S. roughly 38%. Uh, this, is, this is a staggering number. So if you consider... We've been producing dollars. The Fed has been producing dollars for, I want to say it's about 108 years. 30, so point, 38% of all dollars in existence of a production period of 108 years were produced in the past 12 months. So if you just imagine that chart, you know, it's like a long grind upwards and then in 2020 to 2021, it's a complete vertical line. Um, once you get above... 30% annual changes in the money supply per year, it starts to compound. Um, so I would actually look for this rate to double again within the decade, and I think it will double again uh, within a decade of that. So over the course of the next 15, 20 years, I think we're going to be north of 100% money supply increase per year. And hyperinflation is typically defined at, I think, 50% per month. So you're getting into that range. Um, and during this period, I think you'll see weaker currencies collapsing into the dollar. Like we're already seeing, if you see something like in Lebanon, people are scurrying to get dollars as quick as they can. Right. Um, so I think stronger currencies will get stronger in the decades ahead, um, relative to failing currencies, but currencies overall will become much weaker 
against hard assets. So gold, real estate, um, you know, certain equities will do well. And the scarcest liquid asset in human history, Bitcoin, I think will radically outperform all of it. So something like the US dollar will do very well against kind of developing currencies, but the dollar will do very poorly against something like Bitcoin. Yes. And after enough of these economies have dollarized, and again, we're at this inflection point, wherever it may be of, you know, call it, I think 30% is the point of no return. So I think the issuance rate of the US dollar will accelerate over the next two decades. And at some point, um, in my mind, this induces a hyper Bitcoinization type event. Like once market actors wake up to the reality, it's like I can hold something that no one can dilute, that I can completely isolate myself from inflation. As inflation's ravaging the economy, by the way, which when it ravages it in really interesting ways. It's we already have labor shortages starting here in the U.S. I don't know if you've seen this, but yeah, yeah. Um, every you know retail store, restaurants, it's like they can't get Applebee's help gives you a free appetizer if for just sending in an app, uh, a resume, <laughs> <laughs> an application. Yeah, so. once again, distorted incentives. Right, yeah. people yeah. are paid to sit on their ass at home. Why would they go to work? Yeah. So yeah. this leads to product shortages. That leads to price controls. This leads to capital controls. You know, government yeah. intervention starts to layer on top of itself until society um, starts to rip itself apart. And all the while, uh, going back to this 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 illusory solution of printing money, governments just keep trying to print more money, pass more laws, and we've seen this play out time and time again. Um, it just we we it is actually. It's not even an analogy. Like it is actual socioeconomic cancer. You know, it is we've because this is what cancer is when the cellular self-destructive process. I think it's called autophagy. Maybe when your cells are supposed to naturally die and renew, when they stop doing that, that is cancer. It's like the cells stop dying, and that's what central banks are doing. They're stopping the death and renewal of capitalism. Right? They're propping up these zombie companies. And all these other institutions that just um, they they parasite off of the productive economy and and hurt everyone in the long run. I think you put the um, societal implications of of inflation really well in a newsletter the other day. Uh, maybe it was like two months ago or three months ago. I'm trying to remember, but it was the example of a winemaker, right? In mm-hmm. in the example of inflation, right? When when this happens, there are three outcomes. Uh, yeah. The winemaker continues selling. I'm going to probably botch this, but what I remember is like the winemaker continues selling his wine for twenty dollars, knowing mm-hmm. that the value of the dollar has gone down due to inflation, mm-hmm. uh, and so then he's not as profitable. Option mm-hmm. two is the water to water down his wine or use mm-hmm. cheaper ingredients, which decreases the production costs. Uh, yeah. To continue selling for twenty dollars, but then he's ripping people off. And then the third yeah. option is to double the price of the wine to forty dollars. Yes. even though the value of the wine has stayed the same. And yeah. in you extended it out. Now I'm forgetting the final argument here, which is saying yeah. that no. one in three don't happen and that it actually creates these incentives saying that number two, which is ripping people off, even though the winemaker is yes. not a bad guy, he's incentivized to rip people off. I probably That's botched right. half of that, but... No, no, you, you pretty damn close, actually. That was a hard, hard one for me to remember, too. So that is an example I got from a book called Honest Money by Gary North. It's a free PDF on Mises.org. I highly recommend people check that out. It's a brilliant book. Um, the third option is if he sells for $40 so that, that he would maintain his selling price in post-inflation dollars and his margin. But what that does is, again, you're increasing the price, so you're inducing your customers to look at alternatives. So the honest merchant, which would increase his, the price of his wine to $40, is pushing his customers to go look at his competition. And so all the competition is now incentivized to use water, to water down the wine or use cheaper ingredients because they can win business basically by deceiving their customers. And it can be very incrementally, right? This isn't like black or white, lying or truth. It's going to be like, oh, I'm just going to use these class B grapes or just going to use this cheaper barrel or this slight bit of water. And so this um, incentive that inflation creates to deceive your customers in the short run uh, doesn't work in the long run because you're ultimately trading against your future reputation, like the market figures you out eventually. 
But inflation's contracting your time horizon all the while. So you're just trying to survive at this point. And, uh, you know, that contributes to things like shrinkflation, where you see candy bars going up in price, but down in grams. You know, you get like 40% less Snicker bar for twice as, twice as much cost as you used to. Um, so it's bad. Yeah, it's, it's a moral, it's a pragmatic economic cancer on the world but also a moral cancer because you're incentivizing people to deceive one another let's keep going with the hyperinflation causes hyper bitcoinization so okay so the u.s dollar goes up relative increases in value relative to things like um you know the venezuelan currency or the lebanese currency meanwhile the u.s dollars de- uh, is the value is going away relative to something like hard assets like real estate and bitcoin more and more people move into Bitcoin. Bitcoin hits, you know, you know, passes the market cap of gold, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's on its way to M two. What does a hyper Bitcoinized world look like? What? How is it different than the world that we live in? Uh, we could spend years probably trying to answer this question. I'll I'll just try to hit on a few points that I think about. So one is. We have to realize that all wealth is the product of trade, right? It is, that is how humans economize their action. It's how we accomplish greater results with less efforts. It's, it's how we spend, it's how we optimize how we spend our time. Right. So there's all this demand in the marketplace. People want different things. And actually, as you satisfy that demand, uh, the demand grows and changes. So, right. Initially, people want food, shelter, water. Well, give people food, shelter, water. Then what do they want? Well, uh, maybe I want a, a Porsche or some nicer food or a nicer grill or a jet. So as we trade and satisfy more wants, even more wants come Uh, come to bear, I guess you would say. So this is a very important realization that any, that free exchange is the generator of all wealth in the world. Not government, not legislation, not law. Uh, I think the quote I had in one of my pieces is that the legislator's pen cannot create wealth. It can only redistribute it. So we've come a long way, right? We're, we're so, somewhat of a globalized society. Uh, this globalization has increased trade a lot. Technology has increased trade a lot. We ship things around the world. Uh, we now have a digital economy where free exchange, um, at least in the sphere of knowledge, um, and, and sort of crossing over into the goods and services too is being increased again. So that creates more wealth. But we have all these artificial barriers to free trade too. All regulation, all legislation, fiat currencies, capital controls. Um, when you, if you want to start a business, the fact that you have to go out and get a license and pay a tax and wait for this thing to come in the mail, like all these things are frictions to problem solving. So in a hyper Bitcoinized world, all that shit goes away. <laughs> it's like, do you have an internet connection? Do you have Bitcoin? Can you solve a problem? Those are the prerequisites to starting a business. Uh, you don't need anyone's permission effectively. Now this isn't, again, it's not black or white. Like it depends on the nature of the business. If you're going to provide a physical in-service good, then the, the local monopolist on violence can probably still control your behavior or demand, um, that you have a license or pay them a tax or whatever. But, in a lot of aspects of of trade and, and human exchange, um, we'll need less and less regulation and permission, which means we'll have more and more trade, which means we're going to create more and more wealth. So I would expect to see the aggregate level of wealth in a Bitcoinized world explode. Um, the other thing free trade does is that it creates innovation. It's the source of all innovation. It's how we have, it's how we have breakthroughs. We're trading ideas, we're trading products and services. When we're trading products and services, we're trading ideas too, right? It's like some entrepreneur gets the product from their competitor and they take a look at it and they figure out, oh, I can make this improvement and they do it and it's a big hit and they, 
and they sell that idea back into the market and the process repeats. So I'd expect wealth and innovation to explode, which are self-reinforcing. Um, I think government, because it's losing its two most important sources of revenue, which if we look at the U.S. in 2020, we printed $4 trillion and we generated $4 trillion in direct tax revenue. So roughly 50-50 was the revenue mix for the government. In a Bitcoinized world, inflation's gone. So there's half government revenue to zero. Um, and then if you couple that with the fact that most of these transactions are now being conducted in this purely digital money that is more easy, more easily anonymized with every passing day as the tech improves, I think the second piece, direct tax revenue, starts to fall precipitously. Um, especially for entrepreneurs and business sectors that are not that are location agnostic, they can be anywhere. It's like, why would you domicile in the U.S. and pay forty percent taxes when you could just as easy easily hop over to wherever Malta or somewhere um, and pay a low low flat tax rate? So those decreases pass wealth back to the consumers as well. So I think government starts to shrink tremendously. This is the whole sovereign individual thesis that we go from large nation state governments that feed off the economic surplus of, of entire continental economies, right, through, through fiat currency inflation and taxation, government shrinks to be a localized protection service again. So it's almost like the privatization of government in a way. When, um, when you say again, when is the last time that that system actually existed? When government started. So when we, and this is how ancient it is, is when we began accumulating savings at the beginning of the agricultural age. Like once we saved grain and livestock and tools and all of this, there was capital, right? For the first time we transitioned from hunters and gatherers that basically had no capital accumulation because we weren't trading. We started living off the land. We created capital stocks. The protection service, the whoever protected that capital from plunder was the government effectively. So we're, it's reverting government back to this very ancient form, back to the way that it originally emerged. Um, and the other thing, I, I guess the last thing I'd say about the hyper-Bitcoinized future is just that force, compulsion, coercion, all these things lose a lot of relevance. Like Bitcoin, again, I pointed to the book The Sovereign Individual. I'm also writing a blog series on this called Sovereignism. It fundamentally changes the logic of violence. So the reason governments are coercive and you know imperialistic and all of these things today is because money can be confiscated, frankly. They can confiscate, centralize custody of, monopolize, and manipulate money to control people. But Bitcoin is something fundamentally different. Like you can't, if it's custodied properly, you can't confiscate it. Um, it's not, cannot be monopolized. The rules cannot be changed. Uh, so if you consider like a world really on a Bitcoin standard, which would include nation states, nation states go to war with one another. Typically, you know, like when Nazi Germany would invade Poland, for instance, once they conquer Poland, the first place they go is their central bank and they raid all their gold. So that is the economic incentive for Germany to invade Poland is we're going to spend a lot of money going to war, but there's a, the prize is if we're successful, there's a huge honeypot at the end of this venture. That honeypot goes away. If Poland's on a Bitcoin standard and they've custodied it properly, it's like Germany can go invade Poland, take them out, but then there's no, like you've spent all this money to do what? To get nothing at the end of it, right? So you're actually economic negative going to war. So it disincentivize, disincentivizes uh, violence and armed conflict. And that is the area of the rabbit hole that I think is most important for humanity to come to terms with. It's like World War I and World War II, they were predicted by economists of the time when they started. It's like these are just going to be short-term skirmishes, not going to be a big deal. And they based those calculations on the gold reserves of the combatants. What they did not take into account was their ability to expand the money supply. So instead of being... Um, constrained by just their own balance sheet, where it's like, how much money do we have to spend on this war? They were 
op- they open themselves up to the balance sheet of the entire country through inflation, right? So everyone that had savings, every pension, every capital pool, they could now rob them through inflation. And this led to a war of much longer duration, much more violence, much more people dead. Um, it just wouldn't be World War One and World War Two would not be feasible on a Bitcoin standard. And that I think is the most important message we can share with the world. Hmm. Speaking of uh, World War Two, I love the story of uh, Nazis bombing or at least creating the plan to bomb the UK, not with bombs, but with currency. <laughs> It's one of That's my right, favorite yeah. stories of uh, a plan yeah. that actually didn't happen, but was in the works. Yeah. The Japanese so. had that in the works too. Uh, I think it's the oh, interesting. Norbito Laboratory, maybe. Um, huh. They very similar plan. So yeah, it just speaks to the truth of inflation, right? It's a, the the quote I had that was really uh, popular is that inflation is legalized counterfeiting, counterfeiting is criminalized inflation. They are the yeah. same thing. So a central bank is nothing more and nothing less than a currency counterfeiter. That's all it is. Hmm. To start to wrap it up, Robert, where, um, where does Bitcoin go from here? Does it fit, you know, there's a lot of talk around this, uh, you know, Bitcoin super cycle, and then that has kind of died, you know, died down a little bit. And now it feels like the thesis is basically consolidation for the rest of the year, and then maybe another leg up like we saw in 2013. What do you think? Yeah, so there's been some talk about this cycle being different than prior Bitcoin price cycles. Uh, And the price cycle specifically referring to the price action mapped over the four year halving cycle. So, you know, historically, I think Bitcoin on average, uh, 510 days post halving puts in a new all time high price. Uh, And there were some thoughts I think this was popularized by Dan Held several months ago that this cycle could get to such a large market cap that larger um, market actors coming into play could actually drive it to, um, you know, I don't know if it's it's hyper Bitcoinization, but it would just change the pattern of, of the market cycle to where we wouldn't have this huge run up post having 80% plus drawdown and a, a re- repeat um, following the next having. So where do I see it now is I think that I'm still an adherent to the cycle model until it actually breaks. So I think I expect to see a new all time high price by the end of the year, which I had that at around mid quarter four, I think it was the 510 day post having mark. Um, I expect this to be well above the current local maximum of 64,000. Uh, the model that I had done a few years ago, we originally had 244,000 as the next all time high that was adjusted upward to 307 after COVID because of what, you know, what we thought would be, um, significant inflationary pressures. I think those numbers are still in play actually. But it appears to me that the timeline could be extended. So we could have market peak occurring a little bit later, maybe quarter one, quarter two next year. Um, I what's The way I see the broader market is that there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, and again, if we, if we consider that money ensures us against uncertainty, there's a lot of people hoarding dollars, um, sort of expecting and this is not just individuals, these are, you know, banks or have historic high levels of cash on the balance sheet. So I think everyone's kind of in an anticipatory position of there being some type of economic shock or a deflationary um, spike, in which case everything would go on sell, you go in and, you know, scoop up a lot of assets at a discount, and then expectantly, there'd be a huge central bank policy response that would you know, further diminish the dollar on the long tail of the event. So I think that's where we are in general. I, the other piece to this is we just started this aggressive U S dollar supply expansion off the tail of COVID. So this is the end of quarter one, 2020 typically takes about six quarters, you know, roughly 18 months, um, to wash out 
the inflationary effects of something like that. So I don't think we're, you know, we're starting to see it already. You know, you've seen lumber and food and energy, all these prices surging. I think you're really going to see it come quarter four. Uh, and that just happens to coincide with the, the anticipated Bitcoin price peak. So all of that in my mind leads to strong Bitcoin performance in the year ahead. Uh, the last piece I would put to that is every having cycle, the mining, the miners selling pressure is becoming less and less of a component of the overall selling pressure of Bitcoin. So whether, I don't know that we'll have a super cycle per se. Um, I would look for a, a super cycle to the upside above say a $4 trillion market cap. I think that's where Bitcoin really cements itself as a legitimate macroeconomic concern and every capital pool in the world needs to have exposure at that point, just given its size. Um, but I do think that regardless if we hit that or not in this current having epoch, that the fact that mining selling pressure is becoming a lesser component of overall Bitcoin selling over time means that its price action will be less correlated to the having cycle eventually. So I don't know, I guess I would just say that the, we should not expect perfect adherence to this 510 day pattern we've observed historically going forward. It's less and less likely to continue with each having. Hmm. All right. Last two questions. Then we can, uh, right. you can flip the interview and ask me something. What's the story behind the Bitcoin tattoo on your arm? <laughs> um, so I got. I bought my first Bitcoin in 14, but I wasn't down the rabbit hole until really 16 and 17. Got really deep into the rabbit hole. Um, we launched a crypto fund. First one was in April of 17. And then I had a second fund uh, raised in November of 17. And some of the investors that came in late, so late 17, early 18, we went into that 2018 bear market. Um, I had investors that were underwater and I was publishing these um, investor reports, you know, describing what is Bitcoin, what is all these things. Um, and that was, I was becoming less of a hedge fund manager, I guess, at that time and more of someone that's philosophically aligned with Bitcoin. You know, I really started to see I, the, the pieces that came together for me were I had this knowledge of central banking before Bitcoin ever existed. And so I snapped in that piece that Bitcoin was the actual answer to central banking. It's the only, I still think it's the only hope we have. If it doesn't succeed against central banking, then nothing ever will. Um, and at that time, I, this was late 2018. I decided I just had enough skin in the game. I have no other tattoos. This is my first and only tattoo. It's November 2018. Bitcoin's at trading at probably 3,800 bucks. So just a, just been crushed. But the whole time I've been studying and writing about it and learning about it. And I just decided that um, it was time to have real skin in the game. So <laughs> literally I, skin I, in I got, the game. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I got a tattoo. <laughs> and um, I don't know. I don't know if that I'll get any other tattoos actually. So. It, um, I don't regret it yet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, all right. Last question. Then we can uh, flip it. And you can ask me something to close it out. What is the biggest thing that keeps you up at night right now? Um, nothing keeps me up at night. Actually, I sleep like a baby. Um, I mean, I, I, taking that question in its kind of metaphorical sense, I would say that the you know. I've said this a lot. The biggest known unknown for Bitcoin is the state response. I'm just curious how coordinated it's going to be and what it's going to be like, how, how deliberate, how, how coercive, possibly even overtly violent, you know, it, it's hard to say because this is, I think history will regard this period as the, you know, it's the rise of the digital age, which means 
the demise of analog age institutions. So the largest and most important of which are the nation state and the central bank. So I think they are in the death throes now. I don't know what that looks like. Like how do they fight for survival? Um, my general economic theory behind it now is that the, the power structures that cohere them just sort of dissolve into Bitcoin. Because if you consider each of these individual actors that makes up, you know, a nation state or a central bank, they all are individually pursuing their own self interest. So they're all going to be accumulating Bitcoin, even if they hate Bitcoin, you could be completely ideologically aligned against it. But at some point, again, maybe in that $5 trillion market cap range, you're going to start to acquire it, if nothing else as a hedge against its success, you know, it's like for the same reason you go out, and by competitor IP or competitor companies, like you just want to insulate yourself from disruption. Uh, and as those individual market actors acquire Bitcoin, I think it fundamentally changes their incentives and their perspectives on it. So I, I see these power structures as just dissolving and decaying over time. And that um, the you know free market and entrepreneurial action sort of filling the gap as these analog institutions dissolve. Hmm. All right, we can wrap it up. If you want to flip the flip the interview, if you want. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the most important aspect of Bitcoin? Like, I I mean, I assume you have a passion for it in a way, or you know, you're you're working in this. Every it seems like everyone that works in the space has some passion to be here. It's not just uh, some some cold mechanical decision. So, what is that? Um, the passion for you and then like what aspects of Bitcoin do you think we need to share with the world? I found out about Bitcoin in 2015. My family is Hungarian and I was living in Budapest. I was, yeah, I was living in Budapest, Hungary, studying Soviet Union economics and history. Mm. And the students there lived, uh, their, their parents had lived under, uh, in Hungary under the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 1960s, which Hungarian history is pretty niche, but it was a really, really horrible time uh, yeah. to be living in Hungary. And they absolutely loved the concept of Bitcoin. They love self-sovereign money. It was, it was yeah. the world's best invention to them. And their passion got me into Bitcoin. And that was the first thing that ever got me into Bitcoin. And I, so I come back to the States I, I moved to New York. I start working in venture capital. It's really hard for me to explain Bitcoin to family members, friends. I don't fully get it. I just felt their passion. And it wasn't my family's Jewish. And, you know, I had some family who, you know, went through the Holocaust and things like that. And Nazi, you know, you know, spent, yeah. they, were in, in, they were in Europe. And it wasn't until I explained it as painting this picture of imagine if you had, if like our family had Bitcoin during the Holocaust and during, right. you know, while they were living in, in Eastern Europe and were able to ex escape with their money just yes. with math and with, with words in their head, right? Just with their yeah. private key and you could cross borders. And so that, that is what I think is the coolest aspect of it. And I have yeah. since expanded that to include, um, you know, this, I think there's a lot of people in the U S who are getting screwed by inflation. I think there are a lot of mm -hmm. people in third world countries that are getting completely screwed by their government. You look at somewhere like Venezuela, where uh, the citizens used to put all their money into, in, into us dollars. And now you literally can't do that anymore. Yeah. Capital controls. And I think Bitcoin is the solution to that. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm extremely passionate about it. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I agree completely, man. It's a humanitarian movement. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Man. This has been great. You have an amazing podcast called What is Money? I would really recommend listeners go check it out. Um, it does what we just did, but 10 times better uh, because Robert is the host. So I'd really recommend folks go check it out. Robert's on Twitter. Uh, he's also got a sub stack. Uh, anywhere else, Robert, that folks can find you? No, that's it. I mean, you find me on Twitter and you get links to everything else there. But I really appreciate you having me. This is a, yeah. a lot of fun. Awesome. Likewise. Take care, man. All right, man. Thanks.